of talks. Um, we are welcoming in a second, no applause yet, uh, Kate Gray to the stage to deliver a talk on, um, it's called Press Escape, which is the next slide. I already uh, made a note of that in my head. Um, she uh, is a super cool writer who writes for, among other publications, uh, The Guardian. Um, and she's really interested in particularly in uh, games that prioritize quietness and reflection and is beginning to curate uh, an online collection of games that do that particular thing. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, give a big round of applause to Kate Gray with Press Escape. Thank you. Hello, can you all hear me? All good? Yes. Okay, so this is me. I don't usually have uh, a slide with my face on, but you're being treated that to that today. It's my face, this face, mm -hmm. it's right there. You're welcome. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. That's basically the only thing I have to say about me. This is me, I'm on Twitter. Those are the two facts you get to know about me. Okay, next slide. I haven't like worked out a hand signal for this yet. I was gonna go with something cool like finger guns, but I think I'm not going to, because that's kind of lame. So, today I'm gonna to be talking to you about Press Escape. It's not a particularly revealing title, and every time I've told someone about it, they've been like, oh, I get it, like escape from being a journalist. And I'm like, no, it's not that. Um, but it can be that, if you want. What it's actually about is, uh, it's about games that allow you to unwind, which is not usually, well, it is kind of usually a thing that you get with games. Um, you play games to escape. Yeah? <laughs> Do you get it now? Um, so I started thinking about this sometime last year when all that horrible uh, Brexit stuff started happening. And I was like, oh my God, the world is, is going to shit. And what do I do? I'll go to Twitter. Twitter is usually the first place I go. And Twitter was just filled with horrible, horrible things. And I was like, okay, not Twitter. I'll go play a video game. And just everything felt a bit stressful. Like it was like, oh, you've got to do this quest. You've got to go rescue this person. You've got to kill this person. And I was like, I just want to lie down for a long time. Uh, so I felt like I was being swamped with depressing, stressful, and relentless bad news. And it felt like everything was going wrong. And then, next slide, I went to Sweden for a month. Have you guys all heard of Stugan, by the way? Because if not, I'm going to do a tiny pitch right now. So this, this is Stugan. Uh, right here. It's, uh, it's a game development camp slash retreat slash acceleration program uh, in the middle of the Swedish wilderness, which is a great place to be and to make games. And it has Wi-Fi, which is what I was worried about. It has Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's all you need. Um, so it's a bunch of game developers uh, that apply to go to this place. And if they get in, they go there and they make games. And the games were nice. You know, everyone was kind of making games that were a little different uh, from the usual games you'd make. So there was, uh, there's, you guys might have met uh, Paul Narmel from Klondike making a game called Vignettes, where you spin around things. It's great. So they were there. Um, and there were a bunch of other games there as well that, you know, a lot of games at the moment are about like shooting and tense things and fighting. And, and most of those games weren't, which was fantastic. And also, you know, we got to swim in a very cold lake and walk into the forest and watch the stars from a mountaintop, and it sounds like I'm making it up, but I'm not, and you should all apply. Anyway, that's my mini pitch. I started to realize at Stugan that games could be a respite from stress, rather than being a place to kind of, a thing with escapism in mind, you know, where you're role playing as someone else. Maybe you're just being yourself instead, and you're just playing something to get away from stress. So, next slide. This, <laughs> this is adrenaline. Um, this is the thing I started to realize, is that games don't want you to relax. They want to stimulate adrenaline, because adrenaline is exciting, uh, it's entertaining, it's something that's happening chemically to make you enjoy yourself. Uh, and actually, adrenaline makes you like things more. Next slide. So this, uh, you don't have to read it, but um, <laughs> adrenaline makes you like things more, which is why they actually say you should take people on a stressful first date. So things like roller coasters or, or something exciting like that, something that stimulates adrenaline, will apparently, chemically, scientifically, make people fall in love with you. It's kind of manipulative, but you get to go on a roller coaster and that's fun, I guess. But actually, my next point is that I hate adrenaline. I mean, you probably got that from the bit where it said, fuck you, adrenaline. Um, I have anxiety, as I'm sure many people in the room do. And so actually, adrenaline for me is this horrible, horrible thing that makes me have panic attacks. And so I can't go on roller coasters, and I can't, next slide, watch scary films. 
I can look at slides of scary films, that's fine. Why would I want to play a game that makes me feel this way if it just makes me have panic attacks and feel very stressed out about things? So I started looking for games that didn't want me to be excited. And luckily, we're in this amazing indie boom at the moment. Next slide. This is how I chose to show the indie boom. This is uh, Itch at the top. So there's lots of games on there. And then this is the indie game section of The Guardian. Oh, look, it's me. What? <laughs> that wasn't an accident. Um, so <laughs> whatever you want in indie games, you can find it. Uh, so if you go to a place like Itch or even Steam, uh, and you look for things that are a bit different to the norm, you'll be able to find it at the moment. So there are still a lot of games that are, you know, your typical shooters and platformers and gamey game things, but you can also find a lot of things that aren't quite the same as the, the sort of things you'd find in AAA games. Because AAA studios need to keep their audiences hooked, uh, but indie developers, they have smaller overheads, they have larger profit margins, and so they can make, afford to make games for a smaller section of people which is why you see this kind of thing at the moment. So the first game I found, next slide, was Verity. Have you played Verity? Has anyone played Verity? Yeah. Yay! So it's basically as simple as you can see on this screen here. You get to choose a bowl. This one's great, it's got hands on it. Um, and then you get to plant various little succulent plants and cacti and things like that. And then you water them. And it really is that simple. You buy plants, you plant plants, you water plants, and you repeat. And there's a little snail. Can you see the little snail on the right-hand side? He just goes around in a big circle forever. Uh, so it's this very simple game. There's very low interaction. Uh, there's not even that much UI. It's all very minimal. It's all like down the sides there. And it's all very simplistic. Uh, it's not trying to bombard you with quests. It doesn't even badger you to water your plants. It's a quiet, passive game that allows you to participate as much as you want. It's a fluid game, and it sort of grows and shrinks with as much as you want it to. So that was the first game I found, and I love it. I have deleted it from my phone now because I have to play other things, which is horrible. <laughs> but something that made me think about what made Verity and other games different is my friend Paul's talk from Amaze last year. It was called Games as Conversational Spaces. So I started thinking along these lines. Games that let you unwind are the games that let you talk back. They're the games that give you enough silence and enough space to fill with your own words and your own thoughts. Sometimes those are games that give you freedom of choice and don't punish you for going the wrong way. Like, next slide. This is Sacramento by Delphine, who was here earlier, but now she's gone. <laughs> so I would point to her otherwise, but she's not here anymore. Uh, so Sacramento is a game about wandering and exploring and seeing things kind of at your own pace. There's no real goal there's no place that you need to go to. You can just take everything in your own time and you can explore, you can find things. And this looping GIF obviously shows you that this is one of the things you can find. And it's all done in this very um, aesthetically pleasing watercolor, very soft look, which is another thing that helps if you're stressed. But sometimes the games that help with this kind of thing are games that don't give you any choice at all, that set you off down a path and they let you discover things in a predecided way. So this is Paul's game, Orchids to Dusk. Has anyone played Orchids to Dusk? Woo, loads of you. <laughs> so in Orchids to Dusk, um, I mean, kind of spoilers, but it doesn't take anything away from the game. You play this space person, and you crash land on a planet. The planet is all kind of beautiful blues and greens. Again, color as a sort of relaxation tool. And you walk around for a bit. Again, it's very simplistic in terms of UI. The only thing that you get is that little thing on the left-hand side, which is your oxygen meter. So you might be able to guess uh, your oxygen is running out the entire time. Now, in a typical video game, what you might get is the chance to refill your oxygen. Like, if any of you have played Astroneer, it's all about, it's basically the same game, but you can refill your oxygen. But in Orchids to Dusk, all you can do is walk. That's the only interaction you're given. And you are dying, you're running out of oxygen, and at one point, you just fall down and you die. But what happens then is that these little groves of trees and plants and fern-like things just springs up from where you died. And it's networked as well, so that means that it keeps on living. So you can revisit the game, and there'll be more trees than last time, because more people have played, more people have died. It's great. Um, so, I mean, I guess the message with Orchids to Dusk is that death is a certainty, but rather than being terrifying, it frees you from the responsibility of having to do anything. Your only thing that you can do is walk around and explore, so you do that instead. 
So it's interesting that that kind of thing is what relaxes us, and that's because there's two main facts in that. Next slide. Yay. One is that reverting to childhood is relaxing, and two is that cognitive behavioral therapy techniques can be applied to games. So let's talk about that first one. Next slide. Yay. <laughs> I don't know why I chose to go with a baby that has a beard, but he's upside down. It's great. So the main marker of childhood is not having responsibilities, or at least not having any that will negatively affect your life if you mess up. So as an adult, your responsibilities are more important. You have to do your tax, or you might get fined. You have to get a job, or you won't be able to afford to eat or live. And you have to eat well, or you'll get sick. But as a child, all those decisions are made for you. And while that's frustrating at a certain age, like as a teenager, you tend to appreciate that more as an adult. It's also pretty much why that restaurant conversation, next slide, always happens. <laughs> Is there a next slide? Oh, we're good, we're good. So here is a scene that I have written, a beautiful play about choosing. Um, you know, it's that whole thing of where shall we go? Oh, I don't mind, you choose. No, you choose. The, if we choose, the responsibility for a good time is put on us. But if the other person chooses, we're free of worry. We don't have to worry. You know, Italian, sure, I'm fine with that. Like, as long as you're picking, it's fine. And if it's terrible, it's your fault. Choosing things to put it more simply, is an adult responsibility and it's horribly stressful. Which is one of the reasons why Orchids to Dusk, Verity, and Sacramento are relaxing, because they free us from choice. Not having to make choices means that we can focus on the experience instead. But there's another reason that relaxing games can so effectively free us from that everyday stress, and that's because many of them, intentionally or not, use techniques that are also used in CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, which is used to treat anxiety and negative thought cycles. Next slide. I couldn't find a decent one online, and now I'm realizing that this one is way too light. But um, in case you can't see, it's behavior at the top, which cycles into thoughts, which cycles into feelings, and that's generally the CBT thing. Um, so what CBT is, uh, it takes that thought cycle, the negative thought cycle of being stressed and stressing about stress and so on, and having negative feelings, negative thoughts, negative behavior that all feed into one another. Um, and it sort of slowly, calmly convinces the brain that everything's okay. So the way it works is this. The person suffering from anxiety generally closes their eyes, next slide, and focuses on the sensory inputs around them, making sure to reflect and dwell on each one. So I can smell freshly baked bread. I can hear the birds outside. I can feel the warmth of the chair I'm sitting on. And by concentrating on those base senses, by actively forcing your brain to engage with them, you can convince it that there's no immediate threat. It's all very simple biological tricks. And it's basically to do with, next slide, fight or flight. This is a bird with arms. <laughs> fight or flight. Uh, your brain can be a bit of an idiot, basically, and sometimes it's primitive instinct, which used to be for threats like lions and other humans with big sticks. Uh, it tends to react to those st stressful situations in the same way, thinking that there's going to be a lion or a human with a big stick. So adrenaline rushes through your body to prepare you to either fight or run, so it goes to your arms and legs and away from all the important bit in the middle. And it creates a fear reaction. And CBT basically re reverses that process, sending the message to the brain, we don't need to punch or run from anything right now. We're OK. There's bread. There's birds. There's a chair. So for an interesting look at how CBT works in games, I'm going to look at another game, which is this one, uh, Moo Cartographer, or Mew Cartographer, if you prefer. Unlike the other games I've mentioned so far, Moo Cartographer has more of an aim. But personally, I don't really care what it is, because I had a really good time just messing around with what's on screen. So you're provided with all these buttons and dials and switches and gadgets, and you're not provided with any information about what they do. And Basically, you're manipulating this thing in the middle by moving these things. You've got some words here, but they make no sense. Lavender, vinegar, limes, absinthe. Why not? It's a good recipe. Um, and so you twiddle things, and you move things around. And then the map in the middle starts to react. It starts to move and undulate, and weird symbols start to appear. And you start to figure out that you can have an effect on that by moving the things that are on screen. And I think there's a point to it. 
I played around with it for maybe two hours and didn't really know what I was doing. But the point is that I was having a really good time. And also the way that uh, relates back to CBT is that it's all about these sensory inputs. It's all about touching things and having a reaction and focusing on what's happening on the screen rather than why. It's a very simplistic thing. And I guess if you wanted to play it with an object, then that might be a little different. But that's why I really like this game. So has anybody heard of a fidget cube before? It's this thing. Uh, it had a huge Kickstarter. Um, and I was a bit baffled by it until I actually touched one. They're very satisfying. And this is another thing that people use to deal with issues like anxiety and, and stress. You have one of these little cubes, and it has six sides. It's a cube. Um, and one of them is a switch. That one on the left-hand side, you can see, is like a little analog stick. There are some little gears there that you can spin. Um, there's lots of other things. I forget what's on the other side. But the point is that you have this little thing, and you can hold it in your hand. You don't need to focus on what you're doing, because these things don't actually have any output. You can just play with them for the pure pleasure of touching a thing and it making a fun noise. And that's enough. So many people deal with stress and anxiety with things like blankets, stress balls. I have hair clips. I fiddle with my jewelry, which I'm sure many of you do as well. And something to fiddle with gives us that sort of satisfying, comforting feedback. Because fiddling with things works in a similar way to CBT because it convinces our brain that everything's OK. There's not a lion in the room because here I am sitting fiddling with this switch. If there was a lion here, I'd probably be running away. Simple stuff. And of course, some games that fit into these parameters are simpler creatures, uh, ones that provide just a pleasing audiovisual experience. So next slide. There's a reason why the Netflix fireplace, which apparently this is, is so popular. I have actually actively watched it for three hours, which is longer than I watch most things in one go, because it's very soothing. Uh, it's both, like I say, it's audiovisual, so it's both this beautiful fire visual and it's got the crackling sound. And you can just have this in the background and it's really relaxing. Um, so I'd, when I'm stressed or anxious, I don't want to watch things like The Wire or House of Cards or even Gilmore Girls because those require some kind of mental engagement. Whereas a fireplace, you can switch your brain off. You can go back to a primitive brain and just be like, ah, that's nice. <laughs> so there is actually a game that's a bit like this, which is Pixel Fireplace. This GIF is great. It keeps going on. Um, the fire just keeps changing colors, and it's wonderful. Have any of you played Pixel Fireplace? Not enough of you. Play Pixel Fireplace. As much as you can play a game where your only input is typing things in, and it changes color. And sometimes you can put marshmallows on it, just like a real fire. So there's minimal interaction in Pixel Fireplace. You can change the colors. You can put stuff on it. You can type in newspaper or firecrackers, and it does put stuff on the fire. And you can watch those things burn. But all of this is just to enhance the experience. I actually go to sleep personally with the uh, sound of crackling fire in the background, because I find it really soothing. Uh, the, I think it's because perhaps the warmth and the safety of fire is sort of hardwired into our brains. The same as rain, that kind of thing. Um, so that's why I like Pixel Fireplace, because it's just very simple very pretty, and you don't have to worry about quests. So I found that it's been especially hard recently to unwind. Like I said, I started this, this whole idea when Brexit happened, and that was terrible, and then it just kept getting worse. So <laughs> next slide. It kind of feels like this at the moment. Um, it seems like it's impossible to do the things I normally do to unwind, like chat with friends or check up on Twitter to see what my, my friends are doing to see how everyone's interacting, what's going on in the world, because everything is terrible. I checked Twitter just before this. Everyone's yelling at Piers Morgan again, which means that I'm aware that Piers Morgan has said a thing, even though I've blocked him, and then I have to look what he said to see why everyone's mad, and it's just this horrible, endless cycle of terrible things. So I don't think we should ignore the bad things. It's obviously important to stay politically proactive, but I also think we need to take care of ourselves emotionally and mentally. And if we can do that with games, which have been proven to be great tools for many things, more so than films and books and TV, because they're interactive and because you're placing yourself in the shoes of whoever you are in the game, they can provide a tiny oasis of respite for people who need that. So I think that especially in this hugely terrifying time, it's okay to take some time off and it's okay to prioritize self-care. And I hope that games can continue to do that. Thank you. Sure, chat.
thank you very much. Have a seat. So we've got five minutes for questions. It's really interesting, I think, uh, like one of the things I particularly took from that was that um, relaxation and self-care is super personal mm -hmm. because I found Viridi super stressful. <laughs> Uh, because that's, if you're a gardener, you do not want a snail on your plants. <laughs> so I was like, how do I kill the snail? Can I poison the snail? Can I drown the snail? And I just, it just got wet when I tried yeah, to drown it. Yeah, you can so. spray it and it's like, oh, yeah, he's wet no, now. It's like, no, this game yeah. can go away now. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, and I am someone who relaxes via uh, adrenaline. So yeah. <laughs> like, I am possibly a power opposite to that right here. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, good stuff. Uh, thank you so much for that. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, we've got a time for a couple of questions, and I'm just going to kick things off, uh, and then we'll go over there. Um, but so, uh, my question is I wonder, you were talking about cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. and how you would, um, do, can you just give us the three things again? That so, was... it's feelings, behavior, and thoughts. So, what I was really interested in is um, I don't know if you uh, were here for the talk before, but it was uh, Heather talking about. About somatics and how we are completely embodied beings, not just our heads. Mm. And I was wondering if you'd ever thought about things like mu cartographer. If you just look at it up there, and it's all these like really satisfying looking uh, kind of knobs and dials and stuff. I wondered if you'd ever thought about the somatics of these kinds of games, and if you think it would be more effective in, in CBT terms if mu cartographer was a touch screen app, or yeah. if it were an actual physical thing you could play with. I actually think that would be great. I was talking about this last night, um, talking about alt control ideas, because I have all of them and I don't know how to make any of them so I'm always going Could, is this possible um, I think it would be really interesting to have a version of that um, maybe with even less of a goal because like I said that one does have a goal if you want to work it out uh, but a game where you just have a bunch of dials and knobs in front of you and you can just be like beep boop kind of like a baby does with one of those huge mats where everything is a different texture um, because like I said it's it's about kind of reverting to the childlike state of just wanting to touch things and getting a sensory feedback so I'd like to see more games like that um, again maybe with the main purpose of just being a, a fun tool rather than a video gamey kind of game sure, yeah, yeah. Um, and gentleman over here had a question. I'm going to have to repeat it after you say it for the benefit of the recording, so get ready for that tedious experience. Hi. Um, uh, I've been using the with you all evening, but I, what I think is uh, you are missing many different concepts. I mean, in the past when we talked about Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop you there because um, that's quite a long not question. That's more of a statement about what you think. And I think it's certainly valuable, but I think I would suggest that... Um... Okay, so what would your question be? A game and an experience, okay. Uh, do you want to answer that? Because I have like a bunch of theory I can check out. <laughs> um, I mean, personally, my answer to that would be I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, that, I, think that's, I think that's a really reasonable... Okay, so a lot of people throughout every art form have said, is this this art form, though? <laughs> and the people pushing the boundaries of that art form have gone, I don't know, I'm interested <laughs> in it, though. So I think that if you're... If it upsets you that a thing um, made with a game tool isn't expressive of an older definition of games um, or a pre-existing definition of games, then I would say that's fine and, you know, be interested in the expressions of games that um, exist and do satisfy you. But um, treasure your radicals. Like, this is basic, like, Overton window theory, is that if you value the center ground to hold it or even make any kind of progress on those values, then you need to treasure the radicals pushing at the boundaries of them. Um, and I would also suggest that I think that... Um, uh, a lot of the talks in this room today have been about multidisciplinarity and how embodiment and dance and movement and uh, sex and relationships and things not currently seen as the territory of games 
um, can be expressed through the tools we're building in this medium. So I think that um, certainly the makers in games today have given us a ringing endorsement of the idea that we need to push uh, the edges of this form. Um, so I, I think that's what particularly came out of uh, Kate's talk for me. Um, but thank you very much for giving us your ideas. I appreciate that. Uh, well, I, I think it's going to resemble his remark, but it's not at all the same. Uh, there is this uh, definition that is as famous as it is, as it is narrow-minded of like games as interest as a series of interesting choices. I think it's from Sid Meier. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how would you reframe interest in the interest in those games as a thing that is not? as relativistic as the term implies, to say that to some extent these games are interesting but in, in some other way than it is usually accepted under the definition of interesting. Sure, that's a uh, useful question. I am going to try and rephrase that now for the benefit of the recording. Um, so Sid, Sid Meier, Sid Meier, I've not actually said his name out loud before, um, and I've been saying it wrong in my head, I think it turns out, um, said that games are a series of interesting choices, and that's both a useful definition and also restrictive in some ways, and so you're asking perhaps how Kate might reform that. Well, m my question is, uh, his definition is a series of interesting choices. I find it narrow and unuseful, yeah. uh, but... How would you define interest in the context of the game that works? Great. Like? How do you define interest in the context of these kinds of games? God. Um, <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is interesting, because every time I, I talk about this, this kind of thing, people want me to, I guess, uh, come up with a definition of games. <laughs> and I just want to talk about the experiences that, that I enjoy. Um, and the only definition that I've ever come up with of of games in this that I've not done on purpose is I downloaded them off a game website. <laughs> so if I use itch, like, I'll, I will admit there are things that aren't games on there. I've made a Twitter bot on there, for example, that's definitely not a game because there's zero interaction and it's, you know, Twitter. Um, but yeah, God, I don't know. I, I don't I think, think it's, I have it's an perfect answer. accepted to be an aesthete, though, right? Like, yeah. you can be interested in aesthetics and reject the idea that you define a thing. Yeah. as well. Um, I think it's a really interesting like, uh, question, though, and I think that um, I guess we, we begin to find at the edges of our practice insufficiencies of language. So, like, what, does, what is interest? What is... Um, uh, what's the opposite of anxiety? Like, comfort? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. What, what Calmness. Is, <laughs> what is placidity? Like, yeah. wh where do we find it? And I think that the important thing is to keep on asking the questions, uh, especially when you don't yet have a definition or an answer. Um, what's the time? Uh, one more question, and then we'll wrap up if someone has one. Um, there's two there. I'm going to go with uh, the guy closer. Is that, thank you very much for that. So the question there, for the benefit of the recording, I need to stop saying benefit of the recording, um, <laughs> is um, how have you thought about uh, different means of relaxing? So, for example, this gentleman here says that he finds rhythm games really relaxing, the idea of getting into a flow of a thing, and I guess the stillness of mind that you feel in that moment of flow. Um, like, have you thought about the different affordances, or is it just sort of an interest that you have in your particular, um, what you're particularly attracted to? Um, <clears throat> I used to relax with different games. Uh, I was particularly fond of The Witcher, Dragon Age, you know, huge open world, large scale RPGs. And that was the kind of thing I liked. And I think maybe the RPG aspect of that is why I found that relaxing. I could kind of stop being me, start being Geralt or my tiny dwarf character in, in Dragon Age. Um, and that was great up until a point where I could not switch off anymore. And that was because the news, as I've said, was all so horrifying that I just couldn't step out of my own skin. And so that's the point where I'm at at the moment, where I can't role play effectively. <laughs> so I have to find ways of actually being myself and relaxing within a game, which is what I think the games I've mentioned do. They don't ask you to be someone else necessarily. Um, so I think that's why I'm, I'm leaning on these at the moment. Uh, but like I have relaxed with other games in the past. It's just, you know, the current political climate. It's terrible. Yeah. 
I think yeah. there's a really uh, interesting, it's someone in the room as a psychologist, has a psychology background. I would love to see psychological theories um, practice uh, and uh, observe the similarities between any of that and different kinds of means of relaxation that people feel in games, whether it be dissociative or associative or like all of that kind of stuff. I'm not a psychologist. So, um, as all good academics conclude, this needs further research. Um, so, let's uh, give one big last final round of applause to Kate Gray. And we've got a 20-minute break until the final talk of the day. Thank you very much.